opportunity to both introduce Dr. Murray Strauss this afternoon and in addition to present a Lifetime Achievement Award to Dr. Strauss for his years of outstanding research in the area of domestic violence. This is an award that comes from the National Family Violence Legislative Resource Center and I'd just like to read it to you. Uh, to Dr. Murray Strauss, for the past 30 years you've been the preeminent researcher in the field of domestic violence. Your wide-ranging contributions include Behind Closed Doors, the first book-length report on the incidence of domestic violence in American families, and Physical Violence in American Families, an exhaustive compendium of studies on every aspect of the subject. You also developed the Conflict Tactics Scale, the most widely used and most sensitive instrument in the detection of domestic violence. Still more recently, you published an extensive cross-cultural investigation of dating violence and its relation to corporal punishment in 19 countries. And your findings on abuse and dominance have been groundbreaking. In a research area marked by politicization and controversy, you've courageously published your data and stood by them when pressured not to do so. You've chronicled the suppression of data on female violence. You've endured personal attacks on yourself and booing of your presentations. These came both from feminist activists and from religious conservatives. You've been labeled as anti-feminist by the former for presenting data on female violence, and as anti-family by the latter for arguing that reducing patriarchy would lower the incidence of wife assault. This is the very reason why universities need to protect researchers doing bona fide studies on contentious issues. In steadfastly collecting and reporting your data, despite these assaults, you've been a role model for all social scientists who see their first allegiance as being to the truth of their discipline. Thank you, Dr. Strauss. So as you can see, I'm going to talk about some of what's happened in those last 30 years. Um, and I'm going to address three questions which I consider profoundly important as far as preventing and treating partner violence. First, to review with you what are the results of research on these issues, these three issues there, perpetration of partner violence by men and by women, motives and risk factors for partner violence by men and by women, the relation of parents spanking children to partner violence, and then the second uh, of the three questions is um, why and how have these results been denied concealed and sometimes just plain distorted. And then finally, I'll say a few things about what the implications of the denied evidence are for preventing and treating um, partner violence. Um, here's the results of the two studies that uh, were in con considerable extent responsible for this controversy. In our 1975 uh, national survey, uh, we found, and no one was more surprised than me, uh, that um, male partners had a perpetration rate of uh, any assault of 12% and female 11.6. This was not a statistically significant difference, just about the same. Uh, and if you go down below that for severe assaults, uh, kicking, choking, punching, uh, hitting with objects, still not a significant difference. And then, uh, but I was, that was reported in the book Behind Closed Doors, but we didn't discuss it very much and we didn't discuss the implications and it doesn't appear at all in the concluding chapters about what can we do as far as primary prevention, long-term prevention. It's not even mentioned. Um, and in fact, in a preliminary study, to this, I'd found the same thing and ignored it. Um, I, I think there were two reasons. One was that I wasn't really sure of it. It was so contrary to what I was thinking because I just finished publishing a, an essay called um, <coughs> Cultural Norms, one, something like Cultural Norms, Male Dominance, and Partner Violence. Um, no, it wasn't partner violence then. It was and wife beating. Uh, so there was only one victim allowable in the title of that article. Um, and I, I was very much 
thought of myself then and still do as a feminist. Uh, but I was misled by uh, the one-sided view of things that feminists had prepared, and so I didn't even see it much in my own data. As I say, we published it in Behind Closed Doors, but we didn't discuss it. It doesn't appear in the concluding chapter about prevention. And then in 1985, we got almost the same results. And that, from that, because of that, and because uh, the 1975 results had been so severely criticized, um, I'd been thinking about this more and more. The criticisms prompted me to think about it theoretically, why that should happen. Uh, and um, you will find that in a, a, the introductory chapter to a book that Jerry Hotelling and I edited called The Social Causes of Husband-Wife Violence. And in there, we analyzed the inherent social causes for high rates of partner violence by both men and women. And then uh, from that point on, from about 1985 on, I started facing up to this issue and have published quite a number of papers uh, on it since then. Well, here's 10 other examples of the approximately 200 studies uh, showing gender symmetry in um, physical assault. Um, and you, you can just look over that list. Incidentally, this um, is the disk. You talked about having a disk available with all of these. Is, uh, is that available for people? Uh, so there's a disk with this PowerPoint presentation uh, and with two other papers of mine um, that you can purchase. And I, the disk has other, most of the other presentations too. So um, can, it's a valuable resource. Uh, I self-servingly say. <laughs> uh, uh, you can see right down the line, uh, including just to take one of the most recent ones. Uh, if you take this, the second one from the bottom, the Youth, youth Risk Factor Behavior Center, uh, 2006, thanks, uh, publication. There we go. Um, it found all just about identical rates. So uh, this is a pretty well-documented thing, thanks in part to Marty Feeberg, who's here and has published a list of uh, these, uh, an annotated bibliography of these uh, many studies that you can all download, get the journal and download it. It's, Equal rates doesn't necessarily mean mutuality. You can do a community epidemiological survey in which you find about the same rates for men and women, but the 10% of men could be 10% of one set of families and 10% of another. So uh, another innovation that was in behind closed doors uh, based on the 1975 survey, which we also didn't discuss, uh, was the predominance, and Linda Mills mentioned that this morning, predominance of mutual violence, that is both doing it, starting with the uh, National Family Violence Survey in 75, uh, then the National Comorbidity Study, uh, which is a study that I have no f connection to. All the other studies are, uh, uh, except the last, the International Dating Violence Study, are by other people. Um, the next to the last one. So you can see that the predominant pattern is mutual, both violent. And here shows the growth in number of studies showing uh, similar rates of uh, partner violence by uh, both men and women. To make this slide, I just took Fiebert's bibliography and tabulated the years. And you can see by 1985, uh, there, by 1986, there were already 23 studies showing equal rates, including two national surveys. Now, that takes care of the prevalence aspect of gender symmetry. What about etiology? That's important because the current um, uh, 
hardline feminist approach uh, is to say, well, they may be different. They may, may have the same rates, but it's an entirely different thing. You have to s understand the context and meaning, which is code word for excusing. Uh, and, and the most frequent uh, excuse is self-defense. Um, uh, but uh, taking the question of different etiology, the implication is that when men do it, it's for some evil purpose, and when women do it, it's for some morally good purpose. But if you review the literature uh, on this, as Rose Medeiros and I did, you don't find that. Um, here, turning to the self-defense claim, um, I took this from the uh, World Health Organization report on uh, violence, a very influential document around the world. Um, and they ignore violence by women. They treat it strictly as a male-only perpetrated phenomenon. And um, they, among others, claim that when we're violence by women occurs, it is more likely to be in the form of self-defense. And they cite three references for that. They cite Saunders, 1986. There's not a shred of data in that article. Just That's what he asserts, but he presents no data. They cite to Cesaretti. It shows the opposite. Instead of uh, likely to be in the form of self-defense, it's 6.9%. In other words, 90 uh, over 90% not in self-defense. And then Johns, they cite Johnson and Ferraro, and that's a review paper that cites 32 and 37, but presents no new data. Well, uh, here's uh, the results of a study on, you know, it's th that's the self-defense. Then the other main explanation uh, is that it's a response to male dominance, to being uh, oppressed, unbearably oppressed over a period of years. And so you have to understand that in order to understand women who do this. And dominance is a very important one of the risk factors for partner violence. But what this slide shows is that it applies to both men and women. Uh, the, um, uh, on left to right on the bottom is the dominant scale score, and um, the vertical axis is, axis is the predicted probability of there being assault during the 12 months preceding the survey. And it's virtually, it's not a significantly different slope uh, between the two. Um, it's not a, we tested for the significance of the interaction, and there's no significant interaction with gender. So that says it works the same. It's a risk if either partner is dominant in the relationship. And five other studies also show that inequality increases the probability of violence, but that applies to women as well as uh, men. Um, the, um, our 1975 uh, survey, which was published in the Behind Closed Doors book in 1980 found it applied to men and women. Uh, a Hong Kong study found the same thing. A Korean study found the same thing. The International Dating Violence Study found the same thing. That's, that's one of the papers that's on the CD disc. Um, and then a study of uh, uh, Mexican Americans found that if it's both dominance by either party. Another study assessed the similarity between men and women in risk factors and motives. Uh, this was a study of 854 university students. Um, and we found 14 risk factors to increase the probability, be associated with increased probability of severe assaults, such as punching or choking. 12 of the 14 related, were related to severe assault by women as well as by men, and there they are. Poor anger management, antisocial personality, conflict with partner, 
communication problems, criminal history, dominance, uh, applies as you just saw to both men and women, jealousy, neglect history, and the partner had a history of being neglected as a child, uh, and this is uh, sexual abuse history, substance abuse, stressful conditions during the year of the study, and uh, violence approval, attitudes approving violence, such as you heard in those th three studies, three cases that Linda presented this morning from um, So now I can turn to why the, the question of why the overwhelming evidence of gender symmetry has been uh, hidden, denied, or distorted. And I'll just, I have a whole paper on this that lists about 12. Uh, here are just three of the reasons. First, it's inconsistent with male predominance in all other crime. Around the world, in every country, men are predominant in crime overwhelmingly. If you take in the United States, homicides, men perpetrate 90% of them, something close to that figure. Um, and this is true in many countries. So wherever there's statistics comparing men and women, invariably men commit more crime. So these results are completely inconsistent with that and it makes it difficult to believe them. Uh, and second, another reason is that we have empathy for women because they suffer two-thirds of the injuries and two-thirds of the deaths at the hands of partners. It's not only empathy, that's where the bigger injury rate is, where there's more people suffering, so we should uh, give priority to that, but it's also true we need to recognize women have two-thirds of the injuries, but we also need to recognize that men suffer one-third of them. Uh, so we don't pay any, we don't not pay attention to uh, uh, a certain type of disease because uh, it's only one third of the total disease incidents in the country. Uh, we have to put more resources into the bigger risk factor or bigger disease and the, uh, the bigger effect, but we need to pay attention to all of them. And then finally, which is what I'll be talking about in the next few minutes, feminist efforts to hide and distort the evidence. Um, and I'll cover, I think, six or seven methods. Method one is to hide the evidence. Uh, so here's a study that the author sent to me pre-publication in 1987. And you can see the B row has a row for husband to wife violence, overall violence and severe violence, and you can see they're very, uh, they're very similar to uh, the, uh, the husband to wife, the wife to husband rates are quite similar to the husband to wife in the upper row. Then when the study was actually published two years later, that row B has disappeared. Now, no. this is not the only example. I guess I should have put up an example of a paper of mine that has the same sort of thing. <laughs> uh, the paper that I did with Glenda Cantor on, well, it's not quite the, there was no pre-publication copy distributed. I was more prudent. Uh, uh, but our original data analysis was included, it was a paper called The Drunken Bum Theory of Wife Beating. Uh, and the original analysis included women who were drunken bums as well as men. Uh, and that got eliminated along the way and we only submitted for publication the part of men. Uh, uh, binge drinking on the part of men, uh, lower class men. Uh, those are the drunken bums stereotype that we uh, portrayed. So this is a widespread thing. Uh, I was succumbing to peer pressure on that one. That was 1987. It was, uh, no, I, I've forgotten when that drunken bum theory paper. So method two is to avoid this problem of the embarrassing evidence by just not obtaining the evidence um, uh, or to suppress the evidence. So the 
the strategy used is ask women only about victimization and ask men only about perpetration. And that's the strategy uh, used for the U.S. National Violence Against Women survey. Um, um, and uh, um, the Canadian National Violence Against Women survey just only asked women about their victimization. They didn't interview any men. Um, so of course, there couldn't be any women perpetrators. Um, and uh, the other approach, if both victimization and perpetration questions are asked, publish uh, only the data on male perpetration. The most recent example is uh, Michael Johnson's study of intimate terrorists, uh, the one published a year ago, um, in which he had the data for women uh, perpetration, but he published only, the art article is only about male perpetration. Um, and then for a talk I gave in Canada a few years back, uh, I looked at 12 Canadian studies, 10 reported only assaults by men. Uh, method three is selective citation of the uh, research. And here, how it works is pretty simple. If there are 10 studies and two show the favored results, you cite those two and you don't cite the other eight. Um, um, and the World Health Organization study is an example, uh, uh, though there are other problems with that, as you saw. The US Department of Justice, until this year, their summary fact sheet on partner violence cited only the National Crime Victimization Sur Survey, which shows male predominance. They didn't, they didn't cite, they ignored their own critiques of that study, uh, which led to a revision of it, but the revision, while uh, helped, didn't eliminate the problem. Um, and they ignored the study they themselves sponsored to get better data, the National Violence Against Women Survey, which shows that women perpetrated in that study 40% of the partner assaults. But this year, they finally changed it, and the Centers for Disease Control this year also finally changed its uh, fact sheet to, to report the statistics. They don't say anything about it, they just report it, but that's at least better than not even reporting it. Um, okay, method four is to publish conclusions that are not in the data. Um, and here's an example um, in this article by Kernsmith. Um, um, the author, and I don't know if Poco Kernsmith, and someone might know, is a man or a woman? Anyone yeah, have a woman? woman. woman. Okay. Um, uh, she says, quote, males and females were found to differ in their motivations for using violence in relationships. Females reported using violence in response to prior abuse, citing revenge and retaliation as a primary motivation. So it's a response for this, to this unjust situation. Um, and what do the results show? Well, here she did a factor analysis of the questions, and the four, three factors showed up. One she labels striking back for abuse. And that's certainly true for f the first question, to protect yourself. But look at, and, and women are higher on this striking back for abuse. Uh, they have a score of 1.5, men 1.1, and that's a significantly diff different score. But take a look at the items. The second item, to get back at your partner for hurting you emotionally. Uh, to get your partner to, partner to stop doing something, that's coercion. You know, stop running around with another woman uh, um, or another man. To get back at your partner for hitting you first, it's getting back at, that's retaliation, not self-defense. To show anger. So even this first factor, which is the only one that's a significant difference, isn't really, in my opinion, striking back for abuse. The, only that first item. The second factor, disciplining a partner, there's no significant difference. Men and women use disciplining a partner 
as not used, but were motivated by a desire to discipline the partner equally. And the same with the third factor, exerting power, to feel more powerful, to, to be able to do what you wanted to do uh, because you were angry at someone or, some, or something else to, uh, to get over feeling powerless. So no significant difference uh, in those in using violence to punish the partner, discipline, uh, or exerting power. And the one that where there is a significant difference, in my opinion, doesn't mean what she interprets it to mean. Well, the result is to transform erroneous <coughs> when this gets published in a reputable journal, which it did, it transforms an erroneous conclusion into scientific evidence. From here on, papers discussing gender differences, when people review those papers, they don't look at the tables very carefully. They look at the uh, abstract and the conclusions, and the, they're going to cite this as saying, uh, a study by Kern Smith of 60 men and 54 women in a batter or counseling program found differences between males and females in the motivation for using violence, uh, which is not true, <laughs> uh, not what her results show. And because, because it, it they cite an article in a reputable peer-reviewed journal uh, that has an appropriate sample, readers of the subsequent articles in which that is cited will accept it as a scientific fact. Thus, fiction is converted into scientific evidence that will be cited over and over again by those who want to. Method five is to block publication of articles that contradict feminist dogma. Um, it mostly works through self-censorship by authors, fearing their article will, will be rejected, that it will undermine their reputation. My uh, article on the drunken bum theory is an example of that, uh, was a self-censorship. Um, just Three months ago, a colleague, a female colleague of mine, withdrew from co-authorship of an article, an excellent article, and she decided it was better to forego authorship of that article than to risk uh, the stigmatization that would occur uh, if she were the author, a uh, co-author. Uh, method six is deny, deny funding to research that might contradict the patriarchy theory. And just to take one example, the December 2005 call for proposals by the National Institute of Justice, proposals to investigate partner violence and sexual violence, stated that studies of male victims are not eligible for funding. Um, they withdrew it, but I have the, the announcement before. <laughs> uh, um, I wrote and protested that, as did some other people, uh, and fortunately they withdrew it. They withdrew the whole thing, not just the, <laughs> they weren't going to fund anything. Uh, um, uh, and uh, a proposal that I did submit uh, was rejected, um, not funded, because it stated that partner violence is a a human relationships issue much more than it's a gender issue. I didn't even say not a gender issue, I said much more. Uh, and still, it was bitterly criticized for that. And in the tough competition for funding nowadays, if one reviewer out of the panel gives it a very low rating, that's enough to push the priority score below the funding line. Uh, <coughs> method seven, is to harass, threaten, and penalize researchers who produced evidence that contradicts feminist beliefs on this. Um, this started with uh, Suzanne Steinmetz at the when she was at the University of Delaware uh, and was up for promotion and tenure. And there was a letter writing campaign to the, her department, to the president of the university, uh, 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 urging that she saying that she was not a suitable person to promote because you can't believe the results of her research. 
In other words, they didn't believe it, so they don't think anyone else should believe it. Um, and there was a bomb threat at uh, uh, a daughter's wedding. Uh, at the University of Manitoba, there was a lecturer's contract not renewed, probably for a variety of reasons, but one of them was uh, showing equal rates of uh, male and female partner violence. My own experience, uh, I've had um, two graduate students warned uh, that they'll never get jobs if they do their PhD dissertation with me. Um, uh, I was prevented from speaking at the University of Massachusetts by hoots and stamps, and despite re repeated efforts, uh, I f finally adjourned the meeting. Um, and I've been accused of wife beating, accused of sexually exploiting students, uh, uh, and when I was president of the Society for the Study of Social Problems, uh, the first two rows of the uh, room in which I was to give the presidential address. When I stood up to give the presidential address, all the people in the first two rows stood up and walked out. Uh, and that presidential address, when it was published in the journal Social Problem, it's the only, it's the only presidential address ever published in Social Problems where there were critiques following the presidential address. <laughs> And the critique, the article wasn't about partner violence. It was about spanking kids. But somehow, uh, I, I had to be put down, <laughs> is uh, what it amounts to. <laughs> well, um, now, another part of this is biased media coverage. Media coverage is it's biased because it's influenced by what the, uh, the uh, um, reporter and the editor thinks will sell papers or increase viewers, and by their perception of partner violence as, for some of the reasons that I gave you before, as, as something perpetrated only by men. Uh, and so they often misrepresent. Here's an example, uh, f a study of all newspaper coverage of all homicides in Cincinnati, Ohio from 1990 to 1998. And um, it, uh, it shows, um, um, well, that, that's the, another slide, sorry. This is, this is just media coverage in general showing the point of what's going to grab readers or viewers. And it shows this 473% increase in network coverage of homicides during a period, 1990 to 98, when homicides declined by 33%. But then here's the Cincinnati study. Um, this is percent of homicides covered by Cincinnati newspapers um, uh, by sex of offender and victim. And uh, I think this reflects and reinforces the national misperception of partner violence as a male crime. Female kills male, only half of them made it into the newspaper. Male kills female, 79% made it into the newspaper. And similar, there's also a big difference in the number of column inches devoted. Um, here's an article in the American Association of Retired People magazine um, uh, entitled, And Then He Hit Me. And uh, it's an article on partner violence among the elderly. Uh, it says, uh, and it says that, that the number of women on man incidents of domestic violence among the elderly is negligible. That's the exact quote, negligible. And, to, and then they cite, a night to show that, they cite a 1988 study of elder abuse in Boston by my colleagues Carl Pillemer and David Finkelhor. So naturally I knew about that study pretty well. Um, and um, I knew it didn't show that, so I looked up the study again. And what the study does show 
is that 43% of physical violence cases were of the wife assaulting the husband. 17% were of the husband assaulting the wife. Now that lopsided ratio represents the physical capability differences in elderly people, since wives, since husbands on the average are older, um, and more will have a physical decline earlier, quite a bit than um, than wives. Um, so you look look at these things, and it's no wonder that uh, the public thinks it's a male crime. There's many other reasons. Um, that are in the article I, I mentioned that you can get from me. Now, I want to stress that most press information results uh, from efforts to attract audiences, not deliberate bias, but it in a, has that effect. Um, they feature horrific cases of men who virtually enslave and torture female partners. Those stories sell newspapers and attract TV audiences. But such cases, in my opinion, I don't have exact statistics on it, are much less than half of 1% of partner violence cases, not of the population, but of that segment of the population that had an incidence of partner violence in the, in the previous 12 months. The public doesn't know this, and therefore thinks that the typical case is a beaten down, physically injured, and virtually enslaved female victim. And naturally, we want to do something about that. These are the cases most in need of help, but they're a small percent of the total. On the other hand, although they're a small percent of the total, it's nevertheless a large number, even though not a large percentage. So let's say, to pick a figure out of the hat, of, um, from the, our national surveys, two million uh, women severely assaulted a year rounding that number to 2 million. And of cases that fit this uh, stereotypical description, it may be 50 to 100,000. That's a lot of cases, a lot of uh, women in dire circumstances that need help uh, and should have priority. But it's not, it's, it's atypical of what goes on in American households even when there's severe violence, atypical of severe violence. OK, let me turn now to the other denied uh, research, spanking kids. Um, and it's the most ignored cause of partner violence, uh, much more ignored than anything else I can think of. It's also the most widely prevalent cause of partner violence because over 90% of American parents spank toddlers. So it's a risk factor that affects 90% of the population, not 5, 10, or 20%. Therefore, it has tremendous implications for primary prevention. And spanking teaches violence to correct misbehavior, as illustrated in this slide. And then here's the results from um, the 1975, and there's lots more, national survey showing that the more corporal punishment experienced, uh, the higher the probability of uh, assaulting a partner. When people hit a partner, you know, sometimes it's because they're mean, cruel, psychopath, have various kinds of psychopathology. But the overwhelming thing is to correct what the offender thinks of as misbehavior by the partner. Uh, and just fed up with it, finally lose it, and hit her, or hit him. That's the typical thing to uh, the most partner violence is carried out to correct misbehavior, to coerce the partner into doing uh, something. And where do you learn hitting to correct misbehavior? You learn it at home as a, as a toddler, an infant and toddler. Um, that's why I call spanking the primordial violence. Um, and another way of putting it is uh, that the f you know, violence like charity begins at home. Um, and here's a meta-analysis uh, by Elizabeth Gershoff, uh, published in Psych Bulletin a, 
uh, in 2002, uh, showing that corporal punishment has many other <coughs> harmful side effects, not just increasing the probability of hitting uh, a partner. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that there's almost complete agreement between the studies. Look at the harmful effects column. Um, less moral inter internalization. 15 studies, 87% agreement in them. 100% on agreement of studies that more corporal punishment leads to more physical aggression. Um, delinquent and antisocial behavior of kids uh, and so forth. Uh, and then down here, the one I've circled, uh, adult abuse of own child or spouse. Uh, five studies there, all of them uh, agree. What else in child development has this overall, it's 93% agreement between studies. There's nothing else in child development where there is such complete agreement in the results of the research. But does anyone pay any attention to that? No. Um, uh, I reviewed, I've done this three times for three different five-year periods, uh, reviewed child development textbooks, 10 books each time. The latest one, uh, 2000 to 2005, uh, finds that, um, I thought I had that slide here. Um, oh, here it goes. Um, yep. Now, this is what I just told you, the 90% many studies, including three national surveys, um, one, two of them by me and my colleagues, but one that completely independently find over 90% of parents spank toddlers. There's almost complete agreement and harm, showing harmful side effects. But 11 leading child development texts published in 2000 to 2005 Two thirds did not have an entry in the index of corporal punishment uh, for corporal punishment, spanking, discipline, anything like that. So here's something that's part of the developmental experience of almost all American kids, and it's ignored, uh, in virtually ignored in these eleven books. This how much space on corporal punishment? One sentence to a maximum of four pages. They average less than half a page. If you know child development textbooks, they're big, thick, 500-page, often double column, uh, and uh, average of less than half a page. Only one of the 11 advised against using corporal punishment. Two suge suggested it's to be avoided if you can. The trouble is with a two-year-old, you soon come to the conclusion that you can't avoid it uh, because the recidivism rate for whatever you, uh, a two-year-old does, this is actual research on this, uh, it's 50% within two hours and 80% and 80, 80 within the same day. So after three or four repetitions, parents who say, yeah, I don't like to use corporal punishment, I, uh, I'm going to avoid it if I can, but after three or four repetitions, which is typical for a two-year-old, they decide they can't avoid it. Um, that for the sake of the child, bringing up a correct child, they, they have to do it. That's where parents who spank have the big advantage. Parents who spank are prepared to do it over and over and over and over again until the child gets it. And s the trouble is, parents who use things like alternative behave, uh, activities for the child, time out, um, uh, explaining things, uh, they give up and say, well, it didn't work after three or four times. But parents who spank F doesn't work after three or four times. They say, well, I guess I have to spank again. And they warn the child, do that again, and I'll spank you. You don't find parents saying, do that again, and I'll explain it again. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, none of the, none of the, not a single one of those books advised never spanking. Not a single one, despite this overwhelming evidence. It's like advising in a textbook on family relationship advising that slapping wife is not a good idea, uh, but failing to say never slap uh, a partner. Whoops. So what are the implications um, 
uh, for treatment and prevention of recognizing what's been hidden or denied for 30 years? Well, there's three big denials that uh, we need to act on. One is the predominance of bidirectional partner violence. Second, the parallel causes for men and women. And third, that partner violence has a multiplicity of causes, not just one. You've heard this from other people, and you'll be hearing it more uh, as the conference goes. But those, those are what I think are the, the big three that are uh, uh, not just ignored, but often denied. So what are the treatment implications? Well, one is directionality. Who's doing it? That has to be determined prior to treatment, not assumed. The current assumption is that it's male to female. That's the default assumption. And if you're working uh, in many treatment contexts and you decide, well, you want to investigate that, you're likely to be penalized, at least ostracized and maybe fired uh, because the claim is, well, these women are in such a fragile condition, and some are, uh, that we can't ask them if they did anything. Uh, and um, things proceed on the predetermined direction, as you heard this morning in that uh, gripping, horrible case example, uh, based on preconceptions of what it's like. So the first implication is that before treatment, one has to establish who is doing the hitting, to what extent is it bidirectional, which is going to be the predominant situation, to what extent is it male only, to what extent is it female only, and the intervention needs to take that into account. Um, second, uh, on causes. We need to replace the single cause patriarchal system model with a multi-cause model, which recognizes the prevalence of psychological and social problems of both partners. Uh, I've, I've contributed to this problem of doing it because, as was pointed out by one of you uh, this morning, in a, uh, uh, I think it was in Behind Closed Doors, I'm stated that um, only about 10% of partner violence involves some psychopathology on the part of uh, the violent person. That's true, but that's for all partner violence, most of which is the minor uh, throwing a plate of spaghetti at the partner and things, things like that. Um, if you take the severe um, chronic injury and domination kind of partner violence, in those cases the research shows that severe psychological problems, well psychological problems of varying levels of severity uh, are very frequent. Um, so uh, I sh should have qualified that statement in, in that book. Um, and I've learned better now, as you've just heard. <laughs> um, uh, and then openness to a variety of new approaches. For example, restorative justice that you heard about from Linda Mills this morning. Uh, and rather than treating um, uh, anger management as some uh, subversive attempt to hide the, the problem of uh, patriarchy, to embrace it as that as one of the many possibilities, depending on the initial diagnosis of the case and the risk factors involved. So that's treatment. What about prevention? Well, I think we need to direct efforts, prevention efforts, to women and girls as well as to men and boys. So when you see these posters, such as Linda had up uh, uh, this morning, uh, it should show a female figure as well as a male figure as a potential offender not just men as the potential offenders. Um, and in my opinion, the main focus needs to be on relationship skills. Uh, um, as committed as I am to having us achieve a more gender equal world, um, 
taking this immediate problem, it's, I think, primarily a problem of lack of relationship skills in the general population of uh, partner violence and psychological problems in the case of the sev chronic severe um, uh, type. And then lastly, never spank a child, never under any circumstances. Um, because that, in my opinion, is the primordial violence. Even murders reflect this. In the United States, this has now been true for f uh, almost 50 years of data being reported on it. The predominant, uh, almost all murders, 70% of murders are carried out as part of an interpersonal conflict. They're not like this horrible thing that just happened in um, uh, Illinois. Um, they are part of interpersonal conflict. They're carried out to correct the misbehavior of the person murdered. Um, and that, that's shown not only in the U.S. national crime statistics, but in in-depth studies of homicides, that the predominant motive is correcting misbehavior. Sometimes crazy misbehavior, tiny ones, mm, one that caught me, I'll never forget, was um, two guys that uh, rented an apartment together. One smoked and the other didn't, but they had agreed there's going to be no smoking. Guess what happened? The smoker smoked. And they got into an argument about it, and the argument developed into a fist fight, and then one of them happened to have a gun. bang -o. That was a murder. Uh, correcting the misbehavior, smoking. Uh, we didn't smoke anymore, no. <laughs> uh, so that's, as I say, 70% of all homicides. So to conclude, I say it's time to make the effort to end all family violence, not just violence against female partners. That means starts with ending spanking, the cradle of violence, and ending the supposedly harmless violence by women. It's true the injury rate is much uh, lower, but it's not harmless, especially for women. As Linda pointed out this morning, it sets in motion a train of events that's going to lead to her being a victim uh, if she persists. Um, these are basic steps if women, as well as all other human beings, are to be safe in their own homes. <laughs>